welcome to Texas Art Institute educational programs on innovative technologies and techniques. The topic of today's presentation is how to avoid complications with large bore access. I'm Zvonimir Krasier. I'm clinical professor of medicine at Baylor College of Medicine and Texas Heart Institute uh, in Houston, Texas. Joining me today is Brianna Costello. She's an international cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and St. Luke's Baylor College of Medicine. Welcome, Brianna, to this presentation. Thank you, Dr. Krasier, for having me. I look forward to our discussion. Here are our disclosures. I have no disclosures, and uh, Dr. Costello has uh, no disclosures. So uh, let's uh, talk about uh, incidence of transfemoral access site complications during interventional procedures. As we can see on this list, uh, we have uh, many complications that can be seen due to access site problems, such as hematoma, intimal dissection, pseudoaneurysm, AV fistula, uh, access uh, vessel closure, and also closure of the vessels in the lower extremity, as well as distal embolization and then infection. There are other less common uh, problems or complications that occur, such as venous thrombosis, nerve damage, retroperitoneal bleed, and uh, retroperitoneal hematoma, and uh, obviously one of the most complex and dangerous complications with serious consequences is vessel laceration or revulsion. Fortunately, this occurs uh, in very rare circumstances. So as far as vascular complications after percutaneous uh, interventions using large bore sheets, uh, obviously this can carry significant consequences, not only as far as a uh, patient's well-being is concerned, but also it has many other consequences. There is a ample evidence in the literature that uh, vascular access side complications increase mortality three-folds and prolong the length of stay two-folds and there is a 60% increase in uh, health care cost uh, related to the complication. Now, we know that uh, there are many causes of large bore exercise complications. Some of them are patient related, some of them are physician related, and some of them are uh, device related. Among patient related complications, what matters is the vessel diameter. The smaller the vessel, the higher the risk of complications, particularly using large bore sheets. Vessel calcification is one of the major deterrents as far as uh, gaining adequate access and closure at the end of the procedure, particularly when we are dealing with circumferential calcification of the femoral artery. Vessel tortuosity, either alone or in addition to a small vessel diameter, and calcification also plays a significant role as far as complications are concerned. Prior growing procedure, prior use of closure devices, prior surgical access, all can lead to increased incidence of vascular access site complications. Obesity, particularly morbid obesity, or BMI of more than 40 kilograms per meter square, is directly related to higher incidence of complications using large bore sheets. Gender, again, plays a role probably primarily related to vessel diameter in females and also extent of a vascular disease uh, that is uh, seen in older population. As we talk, vessel tortuosity plays a role. Presence of previous uh, diagnosis of peripheral arterial disease of the lower extremities is also a very important factor, as well as recent interventions, particularly in the presence of hematoma or recent use of vascular closure devices. Emergency procedures certainly carry also higher incidence complications due to a variety of reasons. Then there are physician-related complications, such as lack of experience, no uh, ultrasound guidance, which I think is nowadays mandatory in a lot of not only interventional, but also diagnostic procedures, Aggressive manipulation of catheters, balloons, wires, and so on certainly can carry higher incidence of complications. Inaccurate measurements, particularly as far as access site is concerned, 
making the decision about the size of the sheets, size of devices can play a significant role. Also, the axis that's too high above the inguinal ligament or axis that's too low in the femoral or profunda femoris carries higher incidence of complications. And also prolonged procedure, which uh, adds to uh, the comorbidities that are seen, such as hematoma, lower extremity ischemia, and uh, several others. And then there are device-related complications. The larger the sheath, the higher incidence of vascular complications. And obviously, the use of closure devices. Different closure devices have different idiosyncrasies or a particular aspect that are important, whether it's a learning curve or a, a, whether interventionalist is familiar with the use of certain closure device and also using a closure device depending on the anatomy may also play a significant role. Dr. Krasier, since you mentioned, um, you know, prior closure devices in patients and the patients that you know you may have to come back and gain access in that same vessel, um, are there particular closure devices that you would avoid or maybe prefer in those patients? Right. I think that uh, the use of uh, collagen-based closure devices uh, that particularly if they have been used relatively recently within a few weeks uh, of the procedure uh, could uh, add to the complexity uh, of the procedure. Uh, I think that probably this is less commonly seen with suture immediate closure devices, but in general, in all the clinical trials where a large board of closure devices were used, uh, patients that had a closure device used within three to four weeks were excluded from uh, the clinical trial. Very good. Um, and additionally, the um, your mention of ultrasound guidance, I know that it's uh, pretty much a standard of care for all of us in the labs nowadays, um, but there is certainly a learning curve. Um, what is your um, opinion on you know, interventionalists who may have been in practice for a while who just pick up the ultrasound and they may or may not be un uncomfortable or it might make their access more difficult while initially using ultrasound. How do you think they can gain proficiency um, early on while they're trying to, you know, get comfortable with the ultrasound? Well, I think uh, I absolutely agree with you. It's mandatory in all the teaching programs, whether it's a vascular surgery program, residency, or interventional radiology or cardiology that uh, physicians in training, as well as practicing physicians in those fields, should familiarize themselves and should be using ultrasound for access on regular basis. So I would suggest for the beginners, it's important to uh, use the ultrasound, not only for international procedures, but also for diagnostic procedures. And uh, one has to gain expertise by knowing uh, how to get the optimal image, how to identify the artery and separate uh, the artery image from the uh, venous image, and also to be able to determine where the bifurcation of the SFA and profunda is, and to also be able to identify whether you are above the inguinal ligament or below the inguinal ligament. So those are, I think, the basic and essential things for good practice in performing femoral artery access, but not only femoral, but any access, arterial or venous, we use it routinely in all the venous accesses as well, uh, gaining access in the radial or brachial or any other location. Right. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. All right, so let's talk about that challenging anatomy and who are and who are not good candidates for the you know, large bore devices or what anatomy would you perhaps um, go for a different site if you saw? Well, one thing that's important when whenever we use large bore sheets, it's almost routine that we are obtaining a CAT scan prior to the procedure. Because typically for the use of large bore sheets, uh, we are either performing EVAR or TVAR or TAVR. And for those procedures, access site CT is, is mandatory. So I think we should use this opportunity to assess the vessel size, uh, vessel uh, complications, whether it's tortuosity or severe calcification prior to the procedure. 
And that would give us a guidance in deciding where is the primary access and whether the patient is a candidate for the procedure or if the patient is not a candidate for the procedure. On the left-hand side, we can see on the top panel, the access site, we can see it's at the femoral head, which is appropriate location just above the bifurcation of the femoral artery, that essentially there is no calcification of the anterior wall. We do see uh, speckles of calcium of the posterior wall, but that should not be of any significant or severe consequences as far as access is concerned and also for the use of closure devices. Now on the lower panel, we can see a patient that has extensive practically circumferential calcification of the right uh, common femoral artery and anterior wall calcification of the left uh, common femoral artery. Even those, though those vessels are of adequate size, but just the presence of calcium would be, if not absolute, definitely a relative indication for gaining access with large pore sheets, but particularly for the use of any current commercially available closure devices. On the right-hand side panels, we can see, again, not only that uh, there was a problem with, uh, in this particular patient with the access side complication, but there was also severe disease and calcification of the common iliac artery. And then on the right-hand panel, we can see another 3D image of a CT of a patient that had extreme tortuosity of the iliac vessels that might uh, preclude advancing devices or sheets uh, uh, above the bifurcation and being able to uh, complete the interventional procedure. And Dr. Krasier, while you were on that topic and that severely calcified uh, CFA there on the bottom left, um, and what closure devices, since that's, you know, closure makes or breaks the case, what closure device would you prefer if you had to access that artery? Um, and what are your thoughts and reasoning for that choice? Well, we are using, uh, at the present time, all commercially available closure devices, such as ProGlide, ProStar, Manta, and we participated in several clinical trials with devices that are commercially still not available. And uh, in all of those clinical trials, one of the exclusion criteria for those devices, whether they were suture mediated or a collagen based, one of the exclusion criteria was severe access site complications. So I would say this would pose a problem with the most of the devices, but uh, particularly would be of concern to me for the use of uh, suture mediated closure devices. Very good. Thank you, Dr. Frazier. All right, so now that we talked about how the arteries can you know, pose some challenges, can you show us some more examples of this challenging anatomy? Yes, so one thing that we have to consider is uh, what is the proper access site? And here is a very basic information. We all tend to use a crease as a identification location anatomically where the access should be obtained. And that is true in great majority of patients that are not obese, particularly for those that are not morbidly obese. However, with morbid obesity, the anatomy changes significantly and a crease might not be identifiable or it might completely misguide us as far as proper access is concerned. Where you can see on this CT that the distance from the skin level so the common femoral artery on the left side and similarly so on the right side is close to 12 centimeters. None of current generation closure devices will work well in this type of a scenario. On the right hand side we can see that uh, it is difficult to determine where is the iliac crease. Is it the arrow that points above uh, the a straight uh, uh, yellow line, or is it below with a curvilinear yellow line? So we should not use visual landmarks in making the decision for the access. We should be using ultrasound as the most reliable guidance to achieve proper access in 
complex anatomies. This is particularly a challenge uh, when you have a high bifurcation, like uh, seeing in this scenario, also in a patient with morbid obesity. So now you have two complexities. You have morbid obesity, a long distance from the skin to the artery, and you have a very high bifurcation where for all practical purposes, you have probably less than a centimeter of a target zone were to enter into the artery. As we can see on the left-hand panel and right-hand panel, we can see inferior epigastric artery that curves from um, just below the inguinal ligament. And we can see the distances here probably less than a centimeter. And that is even more challenging when you have, like in this particular patient, anterior wall calcification. Right. That adds another complexity. So in this type of scenario, maybe it would be prudent to use for alternate access for your interventional procedure, whether it's a clavian or whatever other access might be better. Very good. So what is a good practice technique, Dr. Krasier, to gain access for large birth sheets and interventions? Well, Brianna, we already mentioned that uh, the use of uh, ultrasound is mandatory nowadays. And uh, not only that uh, it uh, avoids complications, but it gives you assurance where you enter into the artery. One of the great uh, issues and problems that I have seen in my experience is when we uh, gain access uh, with so-called side stick. It means it's not anterior wall stick. Now, none of the closure devices at the present time work very well with side sticks. So you have to make sure that your access with a needle using ultrasound is through the anterior wall at 45 degree angle. That is true for all of the closure devices that we use uh, nowadays. And here are examples uh, on the left-hand panel using ultrasound, we can see the needle that uh, projects uh, into the artery. We can even measure the depth from the skin level to the artery. And we uh, have to again pay attention that we are entering it over the head of femur because this is very important to achieve good manual hemostasis in case of any the closure device that you might use would fail. Now, as you know, Brianna, we use routinely in addition to the ultrasound, micropuncture kit. And I've been using that routinely on all of the cases, including the diagnostic cases. It's a low profile needle, low profile uh, wire, 0.018 wire. It is also uh, <clears throat> a device or a, a catheter system that has a dilator and a, and a sheath that are very low profile. And you can obtain the image through uh, the dilator, which is three French in size. And if you're not satisfied with the access location, you can safely remove it, hold pressure for a minute, and you can achieve good hemostasis. Now on the right-hand side is a fluoroscopic image of uh, access with a micropuncture needle and introduction of the micropuncture wire. You can see that the access was obtained in ideal location over the head of the femur. But also what is very important is that there is a coaxiality between the needle and the micropuncture wire. If there would be a severe angle or any degree of angle between uh, the needle and the micropuncture wire, this would indicate that you actually obtain a side stick entry into the artery. And again, as I mentioned, that might pose a problem at the time of closure with suture media or any other closure devices for that particular reason. Now, uh, we use quite frequently roadmap in many scenarios. And the left-hand lower panel, we can see actually the micropuncture needle entering into the artery. And it's a safe and reliable way of uh, using uh, this technique uh, particularly if for whatever reason we are not using the ultrasound, but that should certainly not uh, uh, exclude the use of ultrasound in most of the scenarios. Now, what is also important is uh, on the right-hand side, we can see uh, 
that micropuncture dilator is placed into the common femoral artery just above the bifurcation, which is ideal location. And we almost routinely obtain angiograms in oblique view. Typically it's 30, 35 to 40 degree angle. If we're on the right side, it's uh, RAO projection. If we do it on the left side, it's LAO projection. And in this projection, we can clearly separate the origin of the SFA and profunda and determine the exact entry of the micropuncture uh, catheter into the common femoral artery. So those are uh, uh, good techniques and essential steps for meticulous access and essential components to avoid problems and complications, particularly when using large bore sheets. Very good. So now for the interesting complications. Can you show us some of the complications you've encountered or you've heard about um, with the use of large bore sheets? Here is an image of a femoral angiogram that was obtained in a patient that was 71 year old and admitted for a EVAR procedure. This patient had a, a significant disease of the iliac artery. Uh, he was status post uh, PTA and stenting of the right common uh, um, external common and external iliac arteries, and a self-expanding stent was placed on. Uh, uh, that location. Uh, the interventionalist here was attempting to recanalize CTO of the left uh, external iliac artery via left uh, common femoral artery approach. And what he encountered is a uh, CTO at the origin of uh, actually the uh, inferior epigastric artery. And as you can see, uh, this particular individual decided to recanalize this vessel using just a plain straight O35 wire, which uh, did not advance well and caused eventually subintimal dissection. So uh, to uh, address this problem and to uh, salvage the case, this particular interventionalist approached uh, this patient with a right femoral artery percutaneous axis on the left hand side panel you can see that there is a self-expanding stent present in the right uh, common uh, iliac and external iliac arteries. He used up and over technique with a four French uh, catheter and uh, he uh, used a, in this scenario hydrophilic coated wire but uh, that attempt eventually failed because now we can see that there is extensive dissection from above and extensive dissection from below. So do you have any suggestion, Brianna, what would be, what are the options in this type of a scenario? What shouldn't have been done and how would you salvage this case? Right, so I, I think that um, using that standard 035 wire may have been um, a bit aggressive at the beginning. So that was probably step one of um, maybe the things you can change. Going up and over um, to salvage this situation doesn't seem like a bad idea. Um, maybe just doing an aortogram to see where exactly how far you've dissected up is probably um, an ideal initial step before just going up and over because you don't know if you've, that dissection flap has extended into the aorta. You might have to actually cover it higher and come, you know, come from higher up perhaps brachial approach um, if you had to. Um, again, you know, injecting with that, I see that four French catheter, you may just be perpetuating more dissection if you inject right away, if you don't know exactly where the dissection starts. So that's another thing that um, maybe you'd want a bigger picture from above first to see what damage has been done. Um, and then if you can recanalize, you know, in the true lumen from wherever it, it dissected to, I think then you can start and, and approach it from above. But knowing where it goes to is important. Right, I, I agree with your comments. I would add also that there are several uh, CTO devices available and CTO wires available as well. I practically would never approach this with the 035 straight wire. There are gentler wires, lower in profile, either 014 
or 018 that are easily torqueable and that are safer to be used for that particular complication or, or problem. And also there are uh, CTO devices available that might help us such as uh, Front Runner and uh, several other ones that uh, are of uh, benefit. Right. And then there are uh, devices that once you cause dissection, to find the true lumen and re-enter the true lumen, you can use re-entry devices. But in this particular scenario, this particular interventionalist did not have experience or expertise with using uh, CTO wires, CTO devices, or uh, uh, re-entry devices. So uh, this is when he actually asked for help. Anyhow, but if you don't have that experience, I would say the most important thing is knowing when to stop. So far, what we can see, there is no extravasation to any significant degree. There is actually a perforation in the common iliac vein, as you can see, and communication between the artery and the vein. But uh, there is no uh, retroperitoneal bleed. So uh, fortunately enough, uh, this particular interventionalist stopped right there because he didn't have comfort level or expertise to uh, remedy this particular problem. And this eventually healed on its own and uh, no major trauma occurred in this particular scenario. Very good. So let's, let's talk a little bit about the sections. And you are familiar with this because you experience it on a daily basis. Uh, uh, not necessarily in your personal practice, uh, but observing procedures, doing coronary interventions, peripheral interventions. And dissections are not uncommon, particularly when you're dealing with complex anatomy and when uh, you're dealing with a CTO and so on. They can be either caused by retrograde approach, like what we've seen in the previous case, or antegrade. They could be a mild, moderate, and severe, or what we call flow-limiting dissections. Usually the ones that occur in a retrograde fashion are relatively benign because they're against uh, the flow and the flap typically heals that area of dissection. Antigrade dissection could be a little bit more cumbersome to remedy, particularly if they're flow-limiting. The causes are many, but the most common one is lack of experience inappropriate procedural planning, where you didn't anticipate something like this happening, no pre-procedural imaging such as CT or ultrasound, or suboptimal procedural Im imaging where you have uh, not used all the uh, modalities that you have available, including intravascular ultrasound or no ultrasound for access, uh, no roadmap, which would be very helpful, uh, inappropriate use of wires, like we discussed in the previous case, and uh, no experience or no availability of uh, CTO devices. Okay. And then how to prevent this? Would you like to discuss this a little bit? Yes. How do you prevent those? Certainly. So I think you really hit home the point of, you know, gaining expertise, not only with the access, but dealing with complications of both access and your procedure. Um, IVIS guided, I mean, we have a peripheral IVIS that is um, wildly, widely available and using it more if you're just not sure what's going on or you're not certain if you've dissected, that's hugely important in deciding what your next step is in the case. And then of course, like you said, familiarizing yourself, even if you're not using them every day because you're not doing CTOs, peripheral CTOs, or even coronary CTOs every day, knowing what the, the wire characteristics are, what the tip, you know, what the weight is at the tip, and you know, um, the stiffness, et cetera, um, is important because when you have to go for a wire, you know, the cath lab staff like you might not know exactly what you're looking for. So you have to have a plan before you start your case. Again, like you said, knowing that retrograde is a little more forgiving, that's important, but antegrade, of course, um, it goes with the flow of the blood, so it could be a little more challenging. So, you know, maybe planning a procedure around that, if you think, think it's gonna be a difficult CTO, maybe you would prefer going at, uh, retrograde to start, and then if you have to meet and go antegrade with it, um, you know, plan accordingly. And then just be ready with a covered, you know, stent, or, you know, um, covered stent, graft if you have to, if you perforate or you um, have a complication. 
Having alternative access um, is also, if you're using a large bore sheath or you're doing a peripheral intervention that you think you know it might be high risk, having extra access, even if it's contralateral, a small French size sheath, um, maybe especially for beginners, um, can be a backup plan that you can always bail out if you need to go up and over. Um, one thing that we see often, Dr. Crazier, especially you, a lot of our patients have stent grafts, um, which make going up and over very difficult. So being able to be comfortable going brachial or even radial if you need to for um, your alternate axis if you have an issue during the procedure is also important in your procedure planning. Very good. Thank you very much for this information. So here is a uh, one of the patient, uh, what I would say, with inappropriate uh, access. And uh, in this particular scenario, the interventionalist uh, did not use uh, the ultrasound to gain access. This was uh, obtained in a patient with a severe obesity. And uh, uh, during the procedure, the interventionalist noticed that the blood pressure dropped down to below 80 millimeters of mercury and the patient was explaining uh, or experiencing severe back pain. Obviously, you immediately, uh, you immediately suspect that there is a retroperitoneal bleed. And in this particular scenario, the angiogram clearly shown with a red arrow where they're bleeding. And uh, you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the angiogram showing uh, extravasation of the contrast uh, in the retroperitoneum. This practically should never occur if you use an ultrasound and gain proper access. And particularly if you're using a micropuncture kit and obtain an angiogram in oblique view, because in scenario for whatever reason, if the access is too high, you can abort the procedure after just uh, entering with a micropuncture kit and no serious complications would occur. And you know, I think um, as, as teaching fellows and you know, working with fellows who are new to gaining access to the femoral artery, you know, get using the ultrasound and checking that needle under fluoroscopy right before you enter the artery is a very simple maneuver that, especially in obese people, if you're just not sure how far your needle traveled because you've been chasing the ultrasound picture, it's an easy way to bail out before you even enter the artery. So if you're unsure, I say just take your time. It's the most important part of the whole procedure. Look under fluoro because it's also a, you know, a tool in our toolbox that we have readily available um, and can avoid major problems at the end of the case. And remember that 45 degree angle is important regardless whether you have morbid obesity or normal anatomy. That is extremely important. Now in this particular patient, this was easily remedied. I was asked to intervene and we gain access by a contralateral approach. Uh, I suggested to the interventionalist to inflate the balloon on the right side. Uh, this was a seven millimeter balloon, seven by 40 in a common, uh, the origin of common and uh, external iliac artery at a very low pressure to stop the bleeding. And then we gain access via a contralateral approach and deploy the stent graft, placing it uh, in ideal uh, position where we still preserve the origin of the inferior epigastric artery. This relatively young individual and uh, control the bleeding in a very efficient way in a relatively short period of time. Very good, it looks, it's a good save, it looks great at the end. Here's another scenario with the use of large bore sheath. And we can see here on the left hand side after the use of 24 French sheath that uh, there is a very uh, significant narrowing of the common femoral artery but also extravasation, which occurred after the use of uh, one of the closure devices. This could happen with any of the closure devices. And uh, what uh, typically uh, has been done in the past, in a lot of scenarios, uh, with a lot of uh, you know, experience, is that you have access from up and over, as we can see here. You can easily advance the wire and advance the balloon of appropriate size, which typically is like six millimeter in diameter and 40 millimeters in length. And uh, 
inflate it at a very low pressure. And uh, this way you have hemostasis until you figure out what to do. And of course, there are several options available. And uh, one option obviously would be to explore it surgically and correct the problem. Another option would be, as you can see, the wire is already out from the artery. So you don't have ipsilateral access to that artery. So the other option would be to uh, put a covered stent, which we did in this particular scenario. You do not necessarily burn any bridges with it because you could do it temporarily until a surgical correction is achieved. Even if you have to occlude the origin of the profunda, because that can be remedied then surgically. But in most of the instances, if you uh, have appropriate location of access, you can avoid occluding profunda femoris by placing a, uh, in this particular scenario, and I will always suggest it's self-expanding stent graft because this is at the bending point and uh, at the inguinal crease, and you certainly do not want to use balloon expandable stent grafts. Here is another scenario. Uh, this uh, is a very interesting. It occurred in my experience. Uh, I would say close to uh, 20 years ago. This patient, you can see, had a pretty relatively decent size, iliac arteries free of disease. Uh, and this patient's primary problem was a pseudoaneurysm just above uh, the origin of the celiac artery. And this was related to a surgical procedure that this patient had previously. And the pseudoaneurysm, as you can see, is pretty large in size, but it is also enlarging on the CT over a period of a year or so. So we made a decision to uh, gain access uh, via left uh, femoral approach for the interventional procedure. Uh, a large sheath at that time was required to place a aortic cuff at the site of pseudoaneurysm. And uh, here we can see uh, the angiogram when the sheath was placed. As you can see, there is no flow distally on the left side indicating that this sheath is occlusive. Now, uh, what is interesting also is that uh, that sheet size, when you measure it, because we have a pigtail with uh, calibration markers, is larger than uh, the origin of the right common iliac artery, and both common iliac arteries are the same size. So this indicates that we really stretched the origin or the whole iliac artery to a significant degree. Upon removal of the sheath, as we can see, the super thick wire is still there. We see this major extravasation that occurred in the retroperitoneum. And uh, there was obviously a significant hemodynamic compromise that occurred immediately with drop of the blood pressure. And, uh, and that obviously needed urgent uh, intervention. Do you have any Suggestion, what would be your choice in this particular scenario? How certainly. to address it? Yeah, so it was certainly there's a perforation, which was likely, as you mentioned, from the sheath. You have a wire across it. So at this point, I would either, you know, take a big aortic occluding balloon or just a balloon right over the where you think that this perforation is to temporize, um, temporize the patient. It's an, you know, in the iliac, which makes me think it's going to need surgical repair. So a balloon um, temporizing measure to stop this massive, you know, RPH and then calling surgery is probably your best option. But temporizing it with a balloon, I think, would just be perfectly adequate. If you don't get good, um, if you're not getting occlusion with the balloon, of course, you can put a coda balloon up um, and into the aorta as well um, to temporize the measure until you can get to surgery. Right, so we were lucky in this particular scenario because we had access from both sides. So uh, our primary um, goal was to uh, stop the bleeding. And one of the best way how to do it is to re-advance the dilator, 
and advance the sheath upward mm -hmm. and stop the bleeding until you are ready to uh, gain access from the contralateral side and put a, a, re, a compliant balloon in the abdominal aorta, distal abdominal aorta to occlude it. And this is the scenario we can see now there is no more bleeding because we were able to advance the sheath upward. When you obtain this image or angiogram and you don't see the origin of the internal iliac artery or you just see a glimpse of it, but no, not all the branches, this would indicate that actually you uh, evolved the internal iliac artery and the external iliac artery uh, and separated from uh, the common iliac artery. And if that is the case, then uh, you do have a serious problem because if the left internal iliac artery is totally now separated from either the common or external iliac artery and you put a stent graft covering the area of uh, perforation or laceration, you will still have retroperitoneal bleed because there is a communication between the left and right internal iliac artery. So actually, uh, you might not resolve the problem on a permanent basis. You might be able to address it on temporary basis until the surgery is done, but not on permanent basis. That's a really good point to remember about that communication, if this were to happen. Right. So as we mentioned, we inflated the balloon, as you suggested, in the uh, proximal left uh, common iliac artery. We, by a contralateral approach, uh, uh, placed in a distal aorta compliant balloon. And then we were able to uh, actually, in controlled circumstances, prepare the patient for surgical repair of this particular problem. And the reason that we chose surgery, not a stent graft, because as you can see here, we have actually evolved this artery and uh, this can only be safely prepared with surgery and not necessarily with a stent graft because this is how schematically it looks like. Mm -hmm. So it's very important to pay attention to angiographic image uh, at the time when this problem occurs because this will guide you how to correct the problem. And as I mentioned, we use compliant balloon and uh, placed it in the infrarenal abdominal aorta. The stent graft was placed only temporarily, and the surgeon then exposed the uh, uh, via oblique projection the area and found that uh, we were correct, that the internal iliac was uh, separated from the origin of the internal or external, and the surgical graft had to be placed from the common to the external. Uh, iliac artery on the left side and the uh, internal iliac was reimplanted and the patient did well. Here is another scenario of a patient uh, that again underwent TAVR with the use of 22 French sheet. And we can see on the left hand side in a stationary image there is extravasation and retroperitoneal bleed. Now uh, we obtained immediately access from the contralateral approach and we can see that actually uh, this extravasation or perforation of the external iliac artery is below the origin of the right internal iliac artery. So this means that the endovascular approach with a stent graft is a reasonable approach in this particular scenario and surgery is not absolutely needed like it was needed in the previous case. So we can see the placement of a, again, a self-expanding stent just below the origin of the right internal iliac uh, with a complete hemostasis and uh, no serious consequences because this was corrected in a very short period of time. And we had already available in the room uh, self-expanding stent graft. And we were prepared with a contralateral approach for visualization and also for intervention. Now here's another really concerning scenario of a patient that was admitted with acute myocardial infarction uh, 
and placement of the impeller device, the patient's lower extremity became ischemic and the device had to be removed. The internationalist placed the wire at the access site and obtained the nagiogram by a contralateral approach. And as you can see here, there is a major extravasation and uh, bleeding that occurred because this vessel was lacerated at uh, the access site. We don't see any distal vessels. And uh, this patient's lower extremity was ischemic. We can see the origin of the uh, profunda femoris on the right side, but no, not SFA. So uh, my recommendation was for this particular scenario to the internationalist that uh, was performing the procedure to inflate the balloon in the external iliac artery and ask for surgical help to remove. There was a thrombus there and also extravasation. I think that brings up a good point, Dr. Frazier. When we're using these large sheets, it's important to have good catheter hygiene and sheath hygiene with um, anticoagulation um, and check your ACT and then um, aspirating and flushing as necessary because these bigger sheets are more prone to clotting as we've seen. Another thing that's very important is, uh, and we didn't mention that on the, the first case, that uh, you could have a problem due to uh, oversized sheets in disease vessel or a problem due to a spasm. So one of the safest ways to deal with this type of a scenario is always to reintroduce the dilator, appropriate dilator that comes with that sheath over a super stiff wire and then gradually try to pull. Uh, typically, I try to pull the sheath over the dilator because that gives me a little bit less uh, pulling and trauma to the vessel. And you do it in stepwise fashion and that frequently works very well. If this scenario doesn't work very well and you have a spasm, I have also used a papaverin. Typically, I will give it intra-arterially uh, 30 milligrams or up to 60 milligrams or uh, nitroglycerin intra-arterially and wait for a couple of minutes. And that might help as well, particularly when you're dealing with a scenario of spasm. You certainly don't want to see this so-called iliac artery on a stick which is avulsion of the iliac artery that obviously leads to serious bleeding and serious, sometimes catastrophic consequences. Yeah, I never want to see that, Dr. Frazier. <laughs> right. So uh, another important step or feature is whenever dealing with spastic arteries or arteries that are relatively small, and when you're not sure whether adequate size sheath for large bore intervention will work or not, is uh, use dilators. You start with a smaller dilators, advance to a larger dilator without even opening the device. Some of the tower devices are extremely expensive and you certainly don't want to waste the device if you cannot uh, gain access with appropriate size sheath. So using dilators is an inexpensive way to uh, establish whether you'll be able to do the procedure and not be able to do the procedure. Of course, there is a learning curve in all of it, but as the sheet sizes decrease in profile, uh, particularly when we talk about TABR, EVAR, and TVAR procedure, the incidence of vascular complications decreases tremendously as well. Of course, the learning curve is important as well, and your level of expertise is important as well. But here we can see just with one valve for TABR procedures, and that's from a clinical trial, where the incidence of vascular complications just by decreasing the profile of the sheet decreased from close to 16% to actually at the present time, even lower than 5% uh, with current experiences. So obviously size matters. So, what usually uh, my recommendations are, as listed here, uh, when having difficulty in advancing large bore or large profile sheets to the iliac artery, anticipate potential complications, as I mentioned, such as spasm, rupture, laceration, or revulsion, and be prepared for it. One of the most important thing is 
to maintain wire access until you're satisfied with level of hemostasis. And that's probably one of the most important things is, as long as you have the wire, you can remedy this problem by placing the balloon uh, in the ipsilateral artery and controlling the hemostasis until you address it uh, in a definitive way. Always maintain contralateral femoral artery access uh, in case of any complications or emergencies, and then you can address it as we discussed previously by placing a compliant balloon in the infrarenal abdominal aorta or gain access uh, to uh, the ipsilateral vessel and then correct it either with a balloon or stem graft or surgical repair. As we have seen in the previous cases, it's very important to identify the site and type of bleeding, whether it's common iliac, whether it's a junction of the external and internal iliac, whether you have a, a vulst, any of the vessels, and uh, that will also guide you on your mode of therapy that is the most reasonable for that particular scenario. You should always have appropriate size endograft available in the room when you're performing interventional procedure using large bore sheets. And Dr. Crazier, if you don't mind, I just want to, you know, sometimes when you are in an emergency and you, you know, you've evolved through it or you've perforated or you've done something and you are having an retroperitoneal hematoma, you know, a lot of these cases, we already have CTs on these patients. As you mentioned, it's almost mandatory that we're getting CAT scans. So you have the size, so you don't have to really guess. So, you know, after you get balloon control over the bleeding, just taking a deep breath and looking back at the CT to help guide you um, can be very helpful um, should you find yourself in this situation. Right. We have also participated in a trial where, where we use Serrano's early bird uh, sheet that is extremely beneficial in anticipating not only whether you have a bleeding, but whether it's a minor or whether it's major, whether it's just retroperitoneal hematoma or is it uh, just hematoma at the access site. So obviously with the large bore sheets, that is helpful. But uh, what is also very important is to have uh, blood available in case uh, of any emergencies. And we always do that on routine basis. And the blood has to be available in the room as well as all the other devices that we might need on urgent basis. Well, uh, Brianna, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity to uh, participate with you in this uh, Texas Heart Institute educational program and in, uh, innovative technologies and techniques, uh, particularly dealing with the issue of access side complications with the use of large board sheets. I hope this will be helpful to those that are in future going to uh, be interested in viewing this program. Yes, thank you for having me, Dr. Crazier. And, you know, truly, um, it's, we're lucky here at Texas Heart Institute to have people like you who are so vested in large bore access um, to learn from. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and a pleasure to be um, talking about it with you. Thank you.